Islam is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we be sure? And how can we reach yaqeen, certainty, that this deen that we profess to be followers of, this deen which, alhamdulillah, is the fastest growing religion on the face of the earth, and it is the largest religion now on the face of the, this earth, walhamdulillah. How do we know that Islam is the truth? How do we know that this deen is the true deen? Because there was a time 1,400 years ago when there was only one man, one very special man. His name was Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And we know him, of course, as Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who began to call the people to the pure and beautiful message of Islam, to the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. So my brothers and sisters, what are the proofs and what are the evidences through which and by which we can know and also that those people who are not yet Muslim, and we ask Allah to guide all the people to Islam. How can they know that Islam is the true religion? First of all, I want to discuss briefly why this is an important subject. The first reason why this subject is very important is, because every Muslim needs to be armed with yaqeen, certainty. Every Muslim has to have certainty that is far from any type of doubt. That Islam is the true religion that has been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his last and final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And certainty does not come about by merely being born into a Muslim family, or a Muslim country, or a Muslim culture. I know there are many brothers and sisters Many people who call themselves Muslim. But if you ask them, why are you Muslim? Why are you a Muslim and not a Christian? Why are you a Muslim and not a Jew or an atheist or something else? The only reply they will give is because this was the religion of my fathers. And I am following my fathers. Of course, this is not really what should motivate a Muslim or anyone to follow religion. Religion is followed, the true religion is followed, because it is the truth. 
And the true religion is based upon proof and evidence. <clears throat> it is based upon proof and evidence. Imagine if I came here today, having arrived recently from London, after my 24-hour flight, and I arrived here in this, mashallah, beautiful mosque. I think I was staring at the ceiling for at least two minutes. Alhamdulillah. We have a beautiful mosque in London as well, Central Mosque. But this, I have to say, mashallah. So if I arrived here and I said, <clears throat> this mosque does not belong to the Muslim community of Sydney. This mosque belongs to me. This is my mosque. It belongs to me. And from now on, I am the Imam and I am the mosque committee. And in fact, I want all of you to leave because I don't really like you. Please go. I could come along and I could say that and I could make a claim. Will my claim be accepted? Will you accept my claim? I mean, come on. I do look a bit like what Jesus is supposed to look like. <laughs> huh? Maybe, if you think about it, I could probably start a cult. And I could get many supporters. And I could get many people with me. Maybe even I could make people think that Jesus has come again. Maybe. Allahu alam. There's plenty of people. If David Quraysh could do it, I could probably do it. So, I bring the people along and now I have lots of followers to tell this is Abdurrahim's mosque. Does that make it my mosque? Because lots of people say it's my mosque. That's not a proof. It's not an evidence. It doesn't make it my mosque. If I really believe that this mosque belongs to me, then in a just society, I will have to bring some proof and evidence in order to support my claim. I will have to go to court. I will have to show the court evidence that can be examined and looked at. So, that the people can decide, the judge can decide based upon the evidence, not upon how I look, not upon the color of my skin, not upon how beautiful my words are, but they should judge me and judge my claim according to the evidence that I bring. It's no good if I stand and say, but I believe it's my mosque. I believe it. I really, really believe it. I have faith. It doesn't make it my mosque. I can believe it all I like, but it doesn't make it true. You have to bring evidence. This is how society works. This is how it works. Yes? Do you have, I'm, I don't know, I haven't checked yet, but in England, in our house, we have meters for the electricity. Yeah? Does you ever have a, come, you ever have a guy knocking on the door coming to read your meter? You have that, we have that in England too. Imagine some guy comes knocking on your door with long black hair and a big beard, doesn't look like a Muslim, with a, with a leather jacket on and a t-shirt with death written on it. Okay, and he has the... He said, I come to read your meter. Well, he wouldn't... That's an English accent. He'd say it in an Australian accent, right? So, you say, <laughs> go away. You're not the meter man. Let me see some identification. Prove to me you're from the electricity company. Because you know that people from the electricity company, they have identification. And you can really, you can ring a number... Did you send the electricity man round today? Yes. What does he look like? Has he got a leather jacket with death on it? And yes, he has. I know he's strange, but so you know. You understand? Why? Will you, you won't let anyone into your house. Because in your house is your wife and your children and your possessions. So you want to see some proof, some evidence. Yes? This is how we are. Why is it then, when it comes to religion, when it comes to religion, people have different standards? When it comes to religion, people say, well, I follow the way of my ancestors. 
They were Hindus, so I'm a Hindu. They were Christians, so I'm a Christian. To the Jew and to the Christian and to the idol worshipper and to the atheist and to the communist and everyone, anyone, bring your proof if what you say is true. If you claim that this is what Allah says, if you claim that this is Allah's deen, if you claim that this is God's revelation, bring your proof, bring your evidence. Because this issue of religion is more important than the issue of my house. It is more important than the issue of to whom this mosque belongs to. The issue of your religion is what is going to decide your fate, whether you will be punished forever in a fire where your skin will be roasted and recreated and re-roasted so you can taste the punishment. Or whether you will experience the delights and the pleasures and the bliss of paradise. This is what is being decided here. Not some few mundane aspects of our worldly life. So we want to see proof. We want to see evidence. Now, if you are a Muslim, and this is the second benefit of this lecture. The first benefit is to give us yaqeen. The second benefit is inshallah, so you will also have a weapon, or not a weapon, but you will have something to be able to give da'wah, to call the people to Islam with. When you say to them, prove to me your religion is true, and they will not be able to prove that their religion is true. One, then they are going to say, brothers and sisters, you prove to me that your religion is true. Yes? It's actually very strange how few people say that. They will argue about everything. They will argue about hijab. They will argue about jihad. They will argue about polygamy. They will argue about the sharia. They will argue about all the things in Islam. And they will argue and argue with you. But none of them say, or very few of them say, prove to me your religion is true. Prove me. That's what I want to know. I want to know whether this is from God or not. Is this from Allah or not? I would like to know out of curiosity, don't be shy, how many brothers think they could, if I ask them now in a imaginary discussion, prove to me that Islam is from Allah. Please raise your hands if you think you can prove. Maybe I will pick you so to come and give the talk. So be honest, if you think that you can prove to me that Islam is from Allah, put your hand up. Be honest now, come on. Come on, I want to see you. One hand, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Certainly anyway, alhamdulillah, which is not, alhamdulillah, it's sad, not all of you. Because without doubt, brothers, every one of you should put your hand up. How can you live in this society amongst the people who are the majority of them not Muslims? And you do not know how to prove to them that your deen is from Allah. How are you going to, what are you going to say to your children when they come back? And they say, oh, mommy and daddy, they taught me that we came from monkeys. Oh, mommy and daddy, they taught me that all religions are the same. Oh, mommy and daddy, they taught me that religion is not really important. It's just an old thing people do, but we have modern society now. Oh, mommy and daddy, they tell me that this Islam is an old religion full of tales of the ancients. What are you going to say to your children? If you don't know and you can't prove that Islam is the true religion. Where is your yaqeen? Where is your certainty? From where do you get your certainty? Maybe, alhamdulillah, you get it from your fitrah, your natural disposition. Alhamdulillah, there is that. But brothers and sisters, we are not anymore living in villages in Lebanon and Iraq or Turkey or wherever else we came from, where we do not come into contact anymore with outside society. We are living 
in the hotbed of the land of the people who are not believers in Islam. Where every minute of every day we are confronted with challenges to our Iman and our Islam. Yes, brothers and sisters, seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. Alhamdulillah, you are here today. First of all, I will have to apologize because this lecture could easily, I could spend three hours or four hours giving this lecture. Or even I could spend four or five days. Because the proof that Islam is from Allah, Alhamdulillah, Allah has given this deen so much proof and so much evidence. We could write volumes of books about it. We could write volumes of books. In fact, Alhamdulillah, volumes of books have been written about it. So we don't have time to mention all of the details. But what I would like to do is to give you an outline and inshallah you can research yourselves later inshallah into more details about this. What are the proofs and the evidences that we can know that Islam is from Allah? We want to know. Prove to me that Islam is from Allah. The first proof and evidence, and for me, I believe this is one of the strongest evidences, is that Islam is a truly universal religion that can be understood by anybody, anywhere. It is based upon certain, uni what I call, universal principles. Some fundamental principles that anybody, anywhere, in any place and in any time, irrespective of their culture, their color, their upbringing, they could understand these things. Because the truths of Islam and what Islam teaches us about Allah, about God, are so fundamental and so rational and so logical, it could only be the truth. Every other religion, if you examine it, has something confusing or misguiding or something contradictory to say about Allah, about God. Only in Islam you will find the pure, unadulterated teaching of Tawheed, monotheism Tawheed. And this Tawheed or this teaching about the one Allah, the one God, is so clear and so easy to understand and so in touch with the human mind and the human reason that one of the proofs that Islam is from Allah is that it teaches this Tawheed, this truth about Allah. Let me briefly, because this could easily be a lecture in itself, let me briefly mention to you what I mean. How can we know about the existence of God. How do we know that Allah exists? Really, the existence of Allah is a simple fact that nobody with intelligence can deny. Nobody with intelligence can deny that there is a creator who created this universe and this world in which we live. Why? Because if we look at the universe, we see that the universe and the world in which we live is organized, that we have planets, solar systems, galaxies, all of them working according to very strict laws. Let us just take the earth on which we live. And this is something Allah he tells us to do in the Quran, to reflect, to reflect, to contemplate on the creation. In fact, Allah he says that in these things there are enough signs, there are enough signs for those who contemplate. Look at our earth. We live on a planet that science tells us today the earth rotates on its axis once every 24 hours. So the sun is shining, you can imagine that's the sun, and the earth is turning on its axis. 
So when the, this bit of the earth is facing the sun, it is day, and the other part of the sun, the other part of the earth is away from the sun, that is the night. So the earth turns on its axis once every 24 hours. Imagine if the earth was spinning very slowly, very slowly. So instead of the earth spinning on its axis once every 24 hours, it spun on its axis once every 20 years. So imagine a day was 10 years long and a night was 10 years long. Yes? Because the earth is spinning slowly. What would happen? One part of the earth's surface would always be exposed at least for 20 years to the sun. And the other part would be in the shade for, 20 year, for 10 years. 10 years and 10 years. So the sun beating down on the earth, as I'm sure you know in Australia, you get the sun here a lot. And Australia, most of it, is desert. I remember flying across a continent that was really mostly a desert. Imagine this, there is no night. The sun is beating down constantly. You will have one part of the earth's surface will become superheated. And the other part will become super cooled. And most likely life will not exist. But the earth happens to spin at this beautiful, precise movement once every 24 hours. Not only that, it is just the right distance from the sun. If it was closer to the sun, it would be, be too hot. If it was further from the sun, it would be too cold. We have gases in our earth's atmosphere. Oxygen, nitrogen and carbon dioxide. In exactly the right balance for life to exist. Oxygen is essential for life's existence. But pure oxygen is poisonous. That's why we need carbon dioxide. And we also need nitrogen, which helps to fertilize the soil. We have a gas on the Earth's atmosphere called ozone. This is the name of the gas, the ozone layer, which is a gas, it is a layer of this gas, ozone. And this gas happens to have the property of filtering out the harmful effects of the sun's radiation. Take away this gas, then radiation that would hit the earth's surface would kill all life. Water is amazing property water has. When water is solid, it floats on the liquid. Meaning ice floats on water. Put ice in your glass of water and does it sink to the bottom or does it float to the top? Icebergs, do they sink to the bottom of the sea or they float on the top? They're on the top. But this is only with water. With other materials, it is the opposite. The solid sinks to the bottom of the liquid. But imagine if water had the property of all other materials. Imagine if solid water sank instead of floated. Then every river would be frozen from the bottom, the seas would be frozen from the bottom, and life would not exist. And we can look and look and look. And what we find everywhere is this precision. Everything is constructed according to a fantastic plan. If we talk about our eyes, our brain, our ears, the animals, the trees, the plants, how they all exist in this symbiotic relationship, each one relying upon the other, you will see what a beautiful balanced mechanism that we live in. How do we explain this? We have to ask some questions. Where did it come from? Where did it come from? Did it come from nothing? Now you see, we talk about universal principles. You see, all human beings, all of us everywhere, we understand certain things. We have a shared set of principles we all understand. Yes? For example, it doesn't matter where you go, you go to Turkey, to Lebanon, to England, to Australia, to uh, the South Pole, North Pole, wherever you go, and you ask a human being, is part of something less than the whole of that thing? Is part a part of something less than the whole? Is a part of this sponge on the microphone, is one part of it less than the whole of it? 
You'll all say, yes, this small part of it is less than the whole of it. We all agree. Every human being agrees. There are some things we all agree on. One of the things we agree on, if we ask someone, do you find something coming from nothing? Do you find something coming from nothing? We say, we don't find that. We don't find something just coming from nothing. Do you find order spontaneously arising from chaos? You say, no. If I see some order, I know someone or something has imposed order on it. That's why I can take out the most simple thing. You know, what's a simple thing is a key. Look, a very simple thing, a key. So simple, really. But there's not one of us who will think that this came from nowhere, from chance and coincidence. We know someone made it, someone constructed it for a purpose. We know that. You know, we know that we don't get something coming from nothing. In fact, when we look in this mosque, subhanAllah, what a beautiful example. We are amazed at the ability of the artist to paint these beautiful geometric designs on the ceiling and around the mosque. And the more beautiful and the more intricate and the more difficult the architecture, the more we are amazed at the ability of those people. Yes? So these things tell us something about the ones who made it. This is what we know from our human experience. So when we ask the question, in fact, Allah asks the question in the Qur'an about this, the universe, about ourselves. Did it come from nothing? Human beings, we know that you don't get something coming from nothing. You know why, my brothers and sisters, atheism is the most irrational, it is the most irrational of all beliefs. Because it is expecting us to believe something that no human being ever has ever experienced. There is nothing in the whole totality of human experience to lead us to believe that something comes from nothing. Let alone the beautiful order that we find in this universe. So then we ask another question. Did this universe create itself? Did it create itself? How could it create itself? Because if it did not exist in the first place, how could it bring itself into existence? And the universe is what? A collection of stars and galaxies and planets. And we do not say that the stars and galaxies and planets have the ability to organize. They need something to organize them. So it could not have created itself. Are we the creators of it? No. Because we ourselves need a creator. We ourselves need a creator. So what is the answer? The answer is that there must be one who has created this universe and brought it into existence. And there could not be two of such gods. Because otherwise you will not find order, you will find chaos. So my brothers and sisters, you see that the first thing Islam is teaching us is something about God. But that is not all. Because we can understand that Allah, this God, His nature must be different from the creation. The creator must be different from the creator. Creation. The Creator must be different from the creation. Why? Because if Allah or the Creator was the same as the creation, then Allah would need a Creator. He would need a Creator. He would need something to order Him and to bring Him into existence and so on and so forth. So we understand that the Creator must be different. This creation is temporary. It has a beginning, it has an end. Allah is eternal. He has no beginning and no end. He is the first before whom there was none, and He is the last after whom there is none. This universe is needy. It needs Allah to sustain it. It needs Allah to make it exist and keep on existing. But Allah is Al-Hayul Qayyum. 
He is the living, He is the self-subsisting. He is a samad He is a samad He is the one upon whom all things depend and He depends upon nothing. All of this, my brothers and sisters, we could understand with our minds without even opening a book. Which religion teaches you this about God? Which religion teaches you that there is one God who is different from and separate from the creation? Who brought it into existence and everything depends upon Him. And this creation, there is nothing in this creation that is like God. There is nothing in this creation which shares the qualities of God. Which religion teaches that? Look, look, Hinduism. What does Hinduism teach you? Hinduism teaches you, essentially, that this universe is God. Between the creation and the Creator, there is no difference. The rat is God, the dog is God, the elephant is God, I am God, you are God, the stone is God, everything is God. This is what they teach, yes. God is everywhere and everything and everything is God. This is what they teach. That's why they worship the everything. They worship everything. You know when they put the ash on their head? You know what that's from? It is from the dung of the cow. Yes. And if you go to India, you will see themselves cleaning themselves, cleaning themselves. In, because they think it's holy. Yes. And this is why some of them, they call themselves, some of the yogis, they say they are God. Because God is in you and God is in me, but God is more in me than He's in you. Yes, so worship me because I'm more of God than you. This is what they say. But we know from these principles that this is false. God is not the creation, nor is God in the creation. That Allah, God, the one, He is separate and different from it. Christianity teaches that Allah became a man. Allah, God, who is a samad He is al hayal qayyum He is al awwal He is the first and the last. They tell us that the one, this one, Allah, He became a man and died on the cross. So he was born of a woman, he was a little baby, he suckled on the breast, he got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, he walked and breathed and ate food, and then they say, they put him on a cross and he died. God died. This is what they say. So they say, God is a man who died. This does not agree with the reason, with the fitra. It does not agree with these principles. How can you ever prove this? You cannot prove it. Because you are asking people to believe two opposite things. That the eternal is temporary, that the everlasting died, that the self-sufficient had needs. It's impossible. Two impo contradictory things. This cannot be true. So all religions that teach these things, we find that if you look in all the religions you will find, and all the books, you will only find really in reality, one religion, one book, that teaches this pure belief of Tawheed, and that is the Qur'an, and that is Islam. And that, my brothers and sisters, is really the strongest proof. Because if you can make people understand that, if people have sincerity, then they will believe on this. But sometimes people, they need more encouragement. They say, yes, that's very sensible. I agree with that. But how can I be sure that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is a prophet of God? Because really, what you have said is very true and beautiful, but any intelligent person could have thought of this. How do I know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa How do I know that he is a messenger? How do I know the Qur'an is the word of God? So they want more convincing. Alhamdulillah, we'll give them more convincing. First of all, we want to look at the Prophet Muhammad Brothers, 
Allah has blessed us with a messenger and this messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wallahi he is, a, he is a proof from Allah he is a proof from Allah that this deen is the true deen his character his personality his behavior his firmness his truthfulness is a clear proof that he was what he claimed to be the messenger of Allah his whole life is a proof that he was a messenger of Allah. And of course we don't have time to mention the whole seerah, but I would like to mention a few incidents. But before that, I would like to think, I would like us again to use reason, to think. If someone comes along and says, I am a prophet. If someone comes along and he says, I am a messenger of God. There are three possibilities. Three possibilities concerning this person's claim. Number one, the first possibility is that this individual or this person is a liar. Like Musaylama, Al Kadhab, like Ghulam Ahmed Mirza of Qadian. Who, from whom the Qadianis, the Ahmadis claim, who now America are telling us that we should now accept them. Although they say Ghulam Ahmad Mirza is a prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah, now they want to teach us about our deen. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, what is more, you want a more clear kufr than that? Or like for example, Elijah Muhammad from the nation of Islam. Who now Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan, he's the leader of them. He, they claim that Elijah Muhammad is the Prophet of Allah. Yes. So either the person could be a liar. He knows he's not a Prophet. He knows that Allah has not given him any revelation. But he has invented this lie in order to get something from people. Like Musaylima al kadab even his tribesmen said they call him al kadab they knew he was not a prophet. But they say he's from our tribe. They just supported him because he was from their tribe. So this is the first possibility. The first possibility is the person could be a liar. So not everyone who comes and says he's a prophet is speaking the truth. Yes? Could be a liar. The other, po the other possibility is maybe this person really thinks that they are receiving revelation. Maybe this person thinks that they are a prophet. Meaning, they're mad. You know, they're majnoon. They're crazy. He really thinks that he sees an angel that comes to him or like the son of Sam. I don't know if you remember the son of Sam. He said that a dog talked to him. And that God spoke to him through the dog. And that the dog told him, go and kill this prostitute and go and kill that prostitute. I'm sure he didn't, wasn't lying, he really believed this, because he was mad. Yes? And the third possibility is, that the person is speaking the truth. These are the only three possibilities. If we look at the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and we ask these three questions, number one, and this is exactly what the enemies of Islam have done. This is the path of most of the Christian writers. They said, we look at number one, they said, Muhammad, they said, A'udhu Billah, and we will show how they are liars. They say Muhammad was a liar. They are the liars. They say Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sat with a Jewish rabbi, he sat with Christian priests, he learned about all these things, he copied the Bible and he invented Islam. He sat in the cave and he invented Islam. This is what they say. Until today, this is what they say. If you read their books, this is what they claim. They say Muhammad was a liar. He invented it. They say that because when any Christian reads the Quran, they will see Abraham, Noah, Yaqub, Yahya, John, 
Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Jacob, they will see laws, they will see things that they are familiar with. They will see descriptions of paradise and hellfire and the day of judgment. So they will say, where did this man, living 1,400 years ago in the desert, how did he learn about all of these things? There were no universities, there were no colleges. How did he get all this knowledge? How did he get all this information? Where did, you know the Qur'an talks about very difficult theological issues like the Trinity. About, for example, atheism. I already mentioned the Qur'an refutes atheism. Where did this man get this knowledge from? So the Christian, he says, well, Muhammad وسلم, he must have learnt it from a rabbi or a priest. He must have copied it from the Bible. And he invented Islam and made this lie. They say he was a liar. Another group of people, modern writers, they say something different. They say when we look at the life of Muhammad, he didn't have the character of a liar. The actions and the behavior of this man, they say he behaved like this because he really believed that he was a prophet. He really thought it, but he was really deluded. Let us look to the life of the Prophet. I want to take as an example, my brothers and sisters, just three incidents. One, three incidents. Yes. The first incident is when Allah, He first ordered the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to call the people to Islam in public. So the Prophet ﷺ went to the top of Mount Safa. Now the Arabs, they had a tradition. The pagan Arabs, they had a tradition that if Mecca was being attacked by an army and someone saw the army, they would have to take off their clothes and run to the top of Mount Safa and warn the people. People, people, an army is attacking and they would have to be naked. I guess the reason behind that is so they don't cry wolf. You know the story, cry wolf, when the shepherd boy, he says, wolf, wolf, wolf. And the people come, he says, I'm only joking, there wasn't a wolf. He does it three times, after the third time the wolf eats him because the people ignore him. Yeah, we all tell that story to our children, probably. So the same thing, the Arabs had this custom. You, you went to the top of the hill and you took off your clothes and you said, an army is attacking us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of course, wearing his clothes, went to the top of Mount Safa. He started calling all the tribes of Quraysh, Ya Quraysh, Ya Quraysh, Ya Bani Hashim, Ya Bani Abdul, Abdul Muttalib, calling all the different tribes. Until either the leader of the tribe came or he sent a representative. So the people of Mecca were in front of him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Oh my people, if I was to tell you that there is an army about to attack us, from behind the hill, would you believe me? And the people said, Oh Muhammad, we never heard anything except truth from you. Why should we not believe you? Wallah, Allah put on the mouth of the Quraysh, put on the mouth of the people of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on their tongues, Oh Muhammad, we never heard anything but truth from you. They testified that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was a siddiq. He was the truthful. They even nicknamed him Al-Ameen. Before that, they, nicknamed, they gave him the nickname Al-Ameen, the trustworthy. Subhanallah. So his people said, we never heard anything but truth from you. And the Prophet sallallahu said, I have come to warn you of a terrible punishment from your Lord. O oh my uncles, O oh my aunts, O oh Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, I cannot help you and I cannot avail you at all in front of Allah, except that you believe in Him and obey Him. And then Abu Lahab, he stood up, he said, O oh Muhammad, 
May your face be rubbed in the dust. May you be humiliated. Is this what you wasted our time for? And then Allah revealed, Tabat yada abi lahabin wa tab. Ma aghna anhu ma lahu wa ma kasab. And as you know, the rest of the ayah goes. The surah. So now people look, my brothers and sisters, how the people of Muhammad testified that he was truthful. Really, they never heard lies from him. They knew he was the most truthful and trustworthy man amongst them. And then another amazing thing happened. His uncle, his own uncle, Abu Lahab insulted him. And on the first time that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he called the people publicly to Islam, he said, you Abu Lahab, you Abu Lahab, this is what the ayah is saying, you will go to the fire, you and your wife. You will dwell in the fire. Is, if you are a, now think about that. If you are a con artist, if, if you want to persuade everybody, here am I, now go back to the beginning, I imagine, say I'm pretending to be Jesus or something, I want to persuade you all that I'm Jesus, right? And I'm saying, I am Him, I'm come, you must follow me, right? And you, you will never believe in me. And you sit there and you stand up, but I do believe in you. I believe you really are Jesus. You understand? If I start from day one, from the first moment, pointing out someone and saying, you, you will never believe in me, that's not the way a con man behaves. Do you understand? If he's a liar, he's clever. He's not going to put himself in a difficult situation like that. Because he's thinking, how can I fool the people? Huh? For ten years, Tabat yada abi lahabim watab, this surah was there. And Abu Lahab, he used to criticize the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, attack the Prophet. If the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went somewhere, he would try and refute the Prophet afterwards. Or oh, for ten years, all he had to do is say, "La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah." But he never did. You see, Muhammad was truthful. We could bring many evidences, but we're only choosing three. The next evidence is this. Think about this. After some years, the da'wah of the Prophet and the da'wah of Islam was beginning to get the people of Mecca worried. So, they sent to the Prophet Muhammad an emissary, Utbah. And Utbah was given an offer. Utbah said, O oh Muhammad, if you want to be our king, we will make you our king. If you want to be the richest man amongst us, we will give you money and we will make you the richest man amongst us. If some, there's some beautiful woman that you desire, just tell us who and she will be yours. And if you suffer from some illness, that you say this spirit comes to you, we will spend any amount of money for you to be cured. Think about that. If a man is a liar, what does he want? He wants money, he wants fame, he wants women, he wants something. They offered the Prophet ﷺ, we'll make you our king, to be king. We'll give you all the money you want. Just leave this message. Give up preaching Islam. Subhanallah. And the Prophet said in those famous words, if I had the, or this is what it's reported anyway in the seerah, although it's a more authentic, he said, I cannot leave this any more than if I took, you can take a torch and light it from the sun. In one of accounts he said, if I had the sun in one hand and the moon in the other, I will never give up preaching this message. Subhanallah. Not like us. Give me a few pounds, don't worry, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Subhanallah. It really is the truth. You know it, brothers. May Allah help us. Subhanallah. So this is the Prophet. So now, are these the words of a liar? Are these the words of an ambitious person? You see, this is why the kuffar these days, when they're writing their books, they don't, they can't, this is not the behavior of a liar. 
Liars don't behave like this. Subhanallah. And then I want to rem- one final incident I want to mention. This is in Medina, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had a son. His name was Ibrahim, and as we know, Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, died when he was six months old. He died in the arms of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yes, his son died. On the same day that the son of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam died, there was an eclipse of the sun. Now, if I went around saying, "You see, that proves he's a prophet," many, some of you might say, "Yes, that's true. There was an eclipse of the sun, and his son died." If you told most of those people who believe in star signs that the Virgo is in the ascendant over the Pisces, which is in the descendant over the Leo, and I'm gonna, you know, be a happy man this week. Right? If you tell them that on the day that the son, the Prophet Muhammad's son died, there was an eclipse of the sun, they will say, "Wow, that's amazing!" And you know, at that time, the people came rushing and they said, "Look, even the sun darkens out of respect, mourning the death of the son of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam." Please, if Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a liar. He would be saying, "This is amazing. Here I've got it. Can you believe this? After all these years, now I've got the chance. You see, everybody, you see, I told you I was a prophet. Yes. And if he was deluded, he'd be thinking, 'Yes, God is showing the signs to the people to prove that them I'm a prophet.' What did Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam do? He called the people to announce to them what." This is the sun, and this is the moon. They are from the ayat of Allah, and they do not rise or set or eclipse for the birth or the death of any man. So when you see this, pray to your Lord, and He taught us the prayer of the eclipse. Are these not the words of a man who was what he truly claimed to be? He was no liar, and he was no deluded person. He was what he claimed to be the messenger of Allah, and his life. And I've only given three incidents proves that. But that is not all, my brothers. On top of that, Allah has given us the great miracle of the Quran, the convincing miracle of the Quran. We don't have time. To even begin to touch upon the Quran and its many miraculous aspects, what can we say about a book that is in fact the uncreated speech of Allah? Allah, He says that if this book was from anyone else than Him, you would find within it many contradictions. You would find within it many contradictions. If you open the Bible, you don't need to get beyond page one. To find the first contradiction, believe me, page one. You don't need to go any further. On page one of the Bible, it tells us in the Bible that God created the night and the day before He created the sun. Yes. But wallahi, it's in the beginning. God created the light. It says this: in the beginning, God created the light. And he called it day, and he created the darkness, and he called it night. The first day came, and the first night came, and it's not until the fourth day. Check it. It's not until the fourth day that Allah creates the sun. On the fourth day, He created the sun to rule the day, and He created the moon to rule the night. Subhanallah. Now, anyone reading that will say. The one who wrote this does not know how night and day occurs. They got confused. In fact, it's an old, ancient Babylonian creation myth. Do you find such contradictions in the Quran? No, my brothers and sisters. You find in the Quran statements that are accurate concerning scientific facts. 
that scientists have only discovered in the last 20 years. We have statements of scientific fact concerning the mountains, concerning the creation of the universe. Where Allah, He tells us, have not the unbelievers seen that the heavens and the earth were united, joined together as one piece of creation. Then we rent them asunder and we bought from every living thing. We, we made from water every living thing. The Qur'an describes the common origin of the universe. How it was rent asunder from this dukhan, from the smoke. Allah created the planets, the Qur'an tells us. The Qur'an tells us how Allah placed in the mountains otad, like the pegs of a tent. How the Qur'an describes that the mountains have roots, which has only been discovered recently. The continental mountains have roots, and they help to stabilize the earth's surface. This is mentioned in the Qur'an. The Qur'an mentions the step-by-step -step stages of embryonic development. Accurately. In detail. So much so that one of the most eminent scientists, Keith Moore, he said about this, he decided to restructure the whole science of embryology based upon the Qur'anic method. And he, alhamdulillah, embraced Islam. He is the world's most famous and most eminent embryologist, Keith Moore. Anyone who is studying embryology in university will have heard of him and his book, The Developing Human. And many other scientists were amazed by what the Qur'an contains. The Qur'an contains historical information that we have just begun to discover today. SubhanAllah, one thing the Christians, if you find in books of Christians, they actually write about some of them saying, one of the biggest mistakes we find in the Qur'an is about history. It's in their writings. For example, the Qur'an mentions that Pharaoh is talking to a man called Haman. Haman was in fact, this is what they say, a courtier who is mentioned in the Bible in the, in, in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Some brothers recently in Cambridge did some research. They went through the hieroglyphs. Alhamdulillah, Allah caused the Rosetta Stone to be discovered and the hieroglyphs to be deciphered. Now people can read hieroglyphs. This is in 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. And they did some research, and you know what they found? They found in this one book in German about hieroglyphs, they found the word Haman. Haman. They were very excited because the Christians were mocking us, saying, look, who is this Haman? So they searched through this hieroglyph, it was in German, so then they had to translate the German, Eichdienbrücken, whatever it was, right? <laughs> and then... And as they translated it, you know what the hieroglyph means? Do you remember the verse? O Haman, build for us a lofty building so we can look upon this God of Moses. Build for us, O Haman, a lofty building. You know what the hieroglyphic word for Haman meant as they translated? He is the chief of the workers of those who work in the quarries mining and building with stone. Subhanallah, the chief of the quarries, of the builders of stone. O oh, Haman, build for us a lofty building. This proves how did this information come to be in a book 1,400 years old, when there was no knowledge of hieroglyphs at the time. How does the Qur'an manage to mention that the ark istiwa al Judi it came to rest on Judi? Whereas the Bible tells us the mountains of Ararat, and now you know they have discovered a boat-shaped object, which they think could be the ark. Upon where is it? Upon a mountain called Judy. You find the Qur'an is full of scientific, historical, not contradictions, but accuracies that no one could have known 1,400 years ago. The Qur'an is a book, my brothers, that is memorized by children as young as six or seven years old, from beginning to end. And unknown numbers of Muslims through every generation have memorized this Qur'an. Huh? Unknown, uncounted numbers of people have memorized this Qur'an. The Qur'an we have today is the same letter for letter, word for word, 
We can eat even, mashallah, as we heard the, uh, our brother reciting the Qur'an, in the same accent that was recited by the Prophet ﷺ 1,400 years ago. This book has been preserved. There is not a book like that. This book, the language of which, when the pagan Arabs heard it, it was enough to make them embrace Islam. Because they knew that no man could have written words of such beauty and eloquence, eloquence and power and uniqueness. And the Qur'an challenged them that if you believe this book is from anyone else than Allah, bring one surah like it. And they could never do it. This Qur'an, my brothers and sisters, has laws. Has laws. So upright. So clear, so straight, so perfectly adapted to the needs of human beings. And this is something I want all of us to think about as Muslims. The laws of the Qur'an, the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, they are not for some time 1,400 years ago. These laws are for us today living in the 20th century. There is not one command or one prohibition in the Qur'an that is out of date for another time and another place. Wallahi, whoever says that is, so, is someone who has left Islam. The Qur'an today is as good and as perfect for human beings as it ever was. Because it is from Allah. And if you examine and you think about these laws, they are so perfect. How could any man think of these things? How could any man have put these things down and understood the human being so perfectly? It could only be from the one who created all things. This is a huge subject to discuss it. I ask you brothers and sisters to research, to find out, to study for yourself. From the simplest things, the use of the smallest sunnah using a miswak. Now we are told, brush your teeth twice a day at least. But 1,400 years ago, Islam instituted the miswak. Even a simple thing, the Prophet ﷺ told us, advised us, when you put your sandals on, sit down. What's so great about that? A brother told me he was studying a book, and he found in this book on a medical journal that such and such percentage of back problems came from people trying to put their shoes on standing up. A simple thing. This is the smallest thing. But if you look at the laws concerning the Sharia laws, the divorce laws, you will find that Islam is full of incredible wisdoms and insights into human nature that no human being could achieve. Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told us in His book. كُلِّ الَّذِينَ كَفُرُوا مِنْ أَحْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ مُنْفَكِينَ هَتَّى تَتِّيَمُ الْبَيِّنَ رَسُولٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ يَتْلُ صُحُفًا مُتَحَرًا Never will the disbelievers from the people of the book or the mushrikeen leave off their disbelief until there came to them Rasulu min Allah, a prophet from Allah, reciting to them a purified scripture containing upright laws. This is what we have. The pure scripture with the upright laws Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah has given us, my brothers and sisters, proof upon proof upon proof. And I've only touched upon this subject so that we can know ourselves and we can prove to all of humanity that what Allah has revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is most certainly the truth. That Islam is certainly the deen before Allah. That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is most certainly his last and final messenger. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Jazakallah khair. You've been very patient, mashallah. And uh, uh, before I uh, continue <coughs> with the questions and answers, I would, uh, I, would like also, I would like to thank all of you, mashallah, for coming here tonight because it's my pleasure to be able to give you some bit of knowledge that I've got to you. Really, it's my pleasure. So I would like to thank you and I'd like to thank the mosque, this mashallah, the brothers and all the community who have built this, mashallah, beautiful mosque. 
And may Allah reward all of you. I mean, inshallah. Hopefully, we'll all share in the reward of Mark's Shahada today, inshallah. <clears throat> so, the first question we won't take too many questions. Uh, very good question here. If in Islam we believe that the Bible, along with the other books, was sent from Allah prior to the Quran, why does the Bible contain contradictions such as the example you gave of the light and the darkness and the night and the day, uh, meaning being created before the sun? The question again. Sorry, it's a bit difficult. I'm holding this anyway. Okay, so. The question is, how come the Bible contains contradictions <clears throat> if we believe in the previous books? The first thing is, brothers and sisters, is that the Qur'an, and this is very important, because sometimes Christian missionaries confuse us on this issue. The Qur'an does not tell us to believe in the Bible. The Qur'an does not mention the Bible. Nowhere in the Qur'an is the Bible mentioned. In fact, even the Bible doesn't mention the Bible. Because the Bible, in fact, even if you ask ten different Christian groups what the Bible is, they will tell you and give you ten different books. So even the Christians don't know what's the Bible. <clears throat> the Catholics have 16 books more than the Protestants. And the Mormons have an extra book altogether. And if you look and you go and you find ancient manuscripts, such as the Codex Sinaiticus, you'll find that it has books that we don't even know about in the Bibles today. So what is the Bible anyway? The Bible anyway is from the Greek word Biblos, which means a collection of books. These books are there because some Christian councils of various Christian denominations decided that these were the authoritative scripture according to their interpretation. So the Qur'an does not in any way tell us to believe in the Bible. All the Qur'an tells us to believe in is in the books that were revealed to the messengers who came before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa of which the ones that have been mentioned in the Qur'an is the Suhfa, which is given to Ibrahim, the Torah, which was given to Musa, the Zabur, which was given to Dawood, and the Injil, which was given to Isa, and the Quran, which was given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Those are the books that we are obliged to believe in them. We believe in them in the sense that Allah revealed these books to those messengers. However, Allah has told us in the Qur'an, and this is the aqidah of the Muslims, that these books have suffered changes, alterations and deletions. Some things have been left out and not mentioned, and they have been kept secret by the Jews and the Christians, and amongst some of those things are the descriptions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which they know about. And other things they have added and changed and corrupted. So the books that they have today, which they call the Bible, is not the Torah and the Injil and the Zabur. It contains something of the Torah and the Injil and the Zabur, and it contains some other things which they have added, and it also there is some things that they have taken out from the Torah and the Injil and the Zabur, which should be there. This is what the Bible is. So we do not believe in the Bible. If you mean, how come Allah has allowed those scriptures to be corrupted, where He has not allowed the Qur'an to be corrupted, that is because Allah was always sending messengers. So when the Torah is corrupted, and when the Zabur was corrupted, Allah he sent Isa alayhi salam to remind the Bani Israel of those things which they had gone astray and what had been corrupted and what had they had deviated from. However, because the Qur'an is the final revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has promised to guard it from all corruption. In fact, the fact that Allah has promised to preserve it and the fact that we have the Qur'an existing 
word for word, letter for letter, the same as was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is one of the proofs and one of the miracles of the Qur'an. Walhamdulillah. Can it go on the floor? Maybe it can go on the floor. When proving the existence of God, some people ask, who created God? How do we reply? The Prophet ﷺ said, and he mentioned to us, that this is something from shaitan. And like all of the plots of shaitan and the statements of shaitan, they really represent foolishness and deception. It's a really a stupid question. In fact, we have already answered this question. It is a question that does not have a meaning. Anyway, the Prophet ﷺ said that we should say when we hear this, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaitan rajim and we should say, "Kul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad." In fact, this surah is an answer to this question. This, this surah is an answer to this question. If you ask who created Allah, we say Allah is one and He is a samad meaning He is the one upon whom all things depend while Allah depends upon nothing. Lam yalid, He was not born. Walam yulad, and nothing gives birth to Him. Walam yukullahu kufuwan ahad. And there is nothing which can be likened unto Allah. Meaning Allah is not like the creation. So Allah is a samad and He is unlike the creation. So this question is only a question that is being asked about a created thing. We ask, who created the tree? Because the tree is a temporary thing and a needy thing that is created. Who created the stars and the sun and the moon and you and me? We are temporary things that have a temporary existence. We have a beginning and we have an end. So we can ask that question about the created things. This question does not exist about one who is the creator but is not created. Lam yulid wa lam yulad. There is nothing like Allah, so you are not making a sensible question. Allah is not like the created things, so we, do not, we cannot ask this question about Allah. Because Allah is unique. This is one way to explain the answer to this. And by the logic that we used, the logic that we used, that Allah must be, His nature must be different from that which He created. He must be. There's a very nice example that I also use. This is from logic. This is from logic. And this is another way you could explain it to somebody. If, for example, I said today, uh, I want to lift up what's the, the, the member here, yeah? I want to lift it up. So I try to lift it up. I can't do it, obviously. So I ask someone to help me. I say, can you help me lift it up? He says, I will help you on the condition that he helps me. And he says, I will help him on the condition that he helps me. And he says, well, I will help him on the condition that he helps me. Everybody says, I will only help if someone else helps me. Everybody says that. Will the member ever be lifted? If everyone makes that condition. It will stay, no, because it will never end. Everyone will be saying, I need someone, I will not help you unless you help me, I will not help you unless you help me. Sounds like the Muslims again, anyway. So, Inshallah, may Allah help us. So, this is the similitude. Think now. If you ask this question, who created the Creator? And then we say, well, if someone created the Creator, then who created that Creator? Then who created that Creator? And who created that Creator? You will have creators creating creators ad infinitum. And just as this member will never be lifted, you will never get anything created. It's the same example. 
But the creation is here. Here we are. It exists. So you can't have creators creating creators eternally. There must be somewhere where it stops. There must be one where it stops. One who is therefore infinite and eternal without beginning and without end. One who is different from the creation, not subjected to the confines of time and space and so on and so forth. So this is one way, inshallah, two ways we can answer that question, alhamdulillah. <clears throat> is the Big Bang Theory mentioned in the Qur'an and how does this come about if it is not? The, it seems very clear that what they call the Big Bang Theory and it's a very interesting theory because the Big Bang Theory basically has brought an end to the claim of those people. There was a time when there were scientists who claimed that the universe was eternal. They called it a static state universe. That the universe is the way it is and it always has been and it always will be. So when they said that, they say we don't need a creator because the universe has always been here and it always will be. So the eternity is there in the creator, in the creation. That's how what they said. But the Big Bang Theory destroyed that completely. The Big Bang Theory said that the universe had a beginning and it will have an end. And then they proved it as much as what you can with science, they proved it scientifically. How they did it, we won't go into it. But it's become now accepted as a fact among scientists that the universe had a beginning in what they call a, the singular, a singularity. And they said from this beginning the universe came into existence. Now this is a very big topic which we could discuss about it and it has very big implications again on the whole discussion of the existence of Allah. Because one of the top scientists of today, he admitted that the state of the universe in its beginning must have been so precise and in such a precise way and the laws were so finely balanced that it leaves us very little explanation except that it must have had a creator. This is what he says. In fact, his name is Stephen Hawkins. He wrote this in his book, A Brief History of Time. You'll be amazed that the guy is an atheist, but it just shows how arrogant and obstinate some people can be. And he goes on to explain a theory that he can never prove. And that has no evidence called super strings. But anyway, this is another theory. This is another thing. So anyway, the Big Bang Theory is alluded to, or it seems to be alluded to in the Qur'an. We can't say for sure, but the Qur'an mentions, Have not the unbelievers seen... <coughs> I think it's in Surah Al-Anbiya. Yes, Surah Al-Anbiya. I think it's verse 33. <coughs> where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have not the unbelievers seen... That the heavens and the earth were united. This is the meaning anyway in English. They were united as one piece. And then Allah rent them asunder. And Allah made from water every living thing. Which is also a scientific fact. So inshallah it does seem that the Quran alludes to what is now a proven scientific fact about the beginning of the universe and Allah knows best. Last few questions because as you can tell my voice is giving up on me here a bit. Uh, what do you think is the best way to teach a revert about Islam without giving them too much at once? Well, the first thing that you teach anybody about Islam, whether it's a revert, or whether it's your children, or whether it's yourselves, is the first thing that the Prophet wasallam taught the companions, the first thing that the revelations were sent down about, and that is what we call aqidah or belief. Uh, or what sometimes is called uh, Iman, whatever names people give it, but it is the correct belief concerning Allah, His Tawheed, to avoid shirk. These are the most important beliefs of all. The most important belief is to believe in Allah and not to make any partners with Him. Because Allah will forgive every sin that He wants, but Allah will not forgive shirk. He will not forgive that people ascribe partners to Him. In fact, it's a subject that even many Muslims are not correctly familiar with. So the first issue that we need to know is about Tawheed and Shirk. And then we need to know about the belief in the angels and the books and the messengers and the day of judgment and the divine decree. 
the good of it and the bad of it, the details and the specifics of those things. And of course the revert needs to be taught how to pray. This is uh, the most important initial aspects of knowledge. And then how to fast, sorry, then how to give the zakah, and then how to fast. And then uh, of course if they uh, have to make hajj, they should be taught about hajj. So these are the important things, and they should be taught manners also, and to avoid the major sins in the level of importance. So the most important manners should be taught first. Truthfulness, for example, keeping your promises, fulfilling your trusts, these are amongst the most important of the manners. And manners to the creation, obedience to the parents, especially as a revert, the revert has to know what is the level of obedience to parents. What if the parents tell you, don't pray, don't be a Muslim anymore, do you have to obey them? So they have to be taught those things. And uh, so on and so forth. To avoid the major sins, they need to be taught about what are the major sins, and so on and so forth, in the order, in the order, in the order of importance, inshaAllah. Okay. okay. How is the identity of a Muslim able to survive in a non-Muslim environment? Are Muslims doomed? in time to disappear in such an environment or is effective dawah able to strengthen Muslim quality and quantity through time? I think the questioner has answered the question. That is a very good question with a very good answer to the question in it. Really, I believe, I believe, brothers and sisters, absolutely, that as I remember, Sheikh Ahmed Dida put one on, I, don't, I haven't listened to the lecture, but I saw it once. Dawah or destruction. And that's the reality. It is dawah or destruction. Either we give dawah, not only to our own community, but to those outside us. Either we are giving dawah or dawah is being given to us. Either we are calling people to Islam or they are calling us to kufr. That's the reality. Either be a caller or you will be called. Call to Allah or you will be called by shaitan. That is the reality. It is dawah or destruction. And I mean for us Muslims living in the West. Or of course Australia is not the West but we call it the West, right? So, like I said brothers and sisters, it's not like we are living in our Muslim countries where we don't meet any non-Muslims living in some village or some city. No. Here we meet them every day. And not only do we meet them, we are confronted with their ideologies, with their atheism, with their disbelief, with their strange morality or lack of morality. This is what we're confronted with every day. You have to be callers. You have to, every one of you has to be a caller to Allah. And to be a caller to Allah, you need knowledge. You have to study the, the religion. You have to learn about Islam. You have to study these things that I was talking about today, brothers and sisters. So, may Allah help all of us to do that. Ameen. Is that it? Okay, brothers and sisters. Last question. Yeah. Yeah. That explanation, a lot of people ask me, is there explanation in the Quran? Why one side's prayer is not yeah, I, I, the brother mentioned another scientific fact, how there is a barrier between the fresh water and the salt water. That's, in fact, there are literally hundreds of scientific statements in the Qur'an, but I didn't, you know, it, they would be lectures in themselves. We could lecture about the, the scientific statements in, about water and the oceans. We could lecture about embryology, just. We could lecture about history, just. Really, believe me. We could give a lecture on these statements in the Qur'an. But I was trying to cover lots of topics in a short time. So I only chose a few things that I mentioned very quickly about the universe and about the embryology. But the brothers write, the Qur'an mentions about how Allah has made a barrier between the salt water and the fresh water. Allah mentioned about the waves, the internal waves in the ocean. So there are many, many statements, alhamdulillah, in the Qur'an and in the sunnah also of scientific accuracy that are amazing to scientists and non-scientists today, alhamdulillah. So brothers and sisters, I hope to see you all inshallah in the lectures tomorrow and the day after tomorrow or just tomorrow, I, I don't know.
Anyway, you can even follow me to uh, Adelaide. Where am I going? I don't know. Brisbane or whatever. Not Brisbane. Adelaide, Perth, Melbourne. So maybe I'll see you there, inshallah. Again, thank you very much. Jazakallah khair to the mosque. May Allah reward you, brothers, in the mosque with much goodness and sisters and bless you in your Islam. Make us all strong in Islam. Increase us in knowledge and iman and taqwa. And make all of us, inshallah, call us to Allah. So all of us, inshallah, get the ajr of bringing someone like Mark to Islam, inshallah. And that will be better than all the wealth that you can get in this world. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana. Wa kina adhab al-nar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Say after me. Ashadu. Ashadu. An la. An la. Ilaha. Ilaha. Il, il, Allah, Allah, wa, wa, ashadu, ashadu, anna, anna, Muhammadan, Muhammadan, Rasulullah, Rasulullah. That means I testify that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is His messenger. You are now, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. You are a Muslim, mashallah. <laughs> Wasn't that bad? <laughs> he gets a kiss from home. <laughs> <laughs>